joining us today. My name is Kelly Kunkel, and I'm an extension educator in health and nutrition with the University of Minnesota Extension. And we are on our fourth in the series, the Family Friendly Earth Care series today um, on edibles and decoratives from the woods or backyard. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Gary Wyatt. He's our presenter for today, but also to, talk, to say a thanks to Julie Larson. She is our webinar producer today and she is recording this webinar. And so um, I, we've had several questions um, from people wondering if this will be recorded and you'll be getting the link. And yes, you will. Um, you will get the link as well as a handout um, to all of the um, websites that Gary is um, going to be referring to. So again, Gary Wyatt is an agroforestry extension educator and extension professor with the University of Minnesota Extension and the Mankato Regional Office. He promotes sustainable agroforestry practices that are economical and protect our soil, our water, our wildlife and natural resources. Gary has more than 38 years of extension experience in Minnesota. So please join me in a virtual round of applause for Gary Wyatt. Well, thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Julie. Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Yes, yes. and uh, actually keep working in, in the chat if you like, uh, if you can name any of the uh, non-timber forest products or the edibles on the screen or decoratives, uh, go, go ahead and put those in chat. Um, this is a presentation that I've given over the years and actually it's, it seems to be more popular now than ever uh, with the uh, COVID and uh, kind of lockdown that we've had to, for the two years that we've been in COVID uh, protocol. And um, people are interested in growing their own uh, food in the backyard, in either a garden or a shrub. And we'll talk about some of those shrubs that produce nuts and also um, fruits uh, that you can plant uh, almost anywhere. And uh, yeah, did anybody, uh, I guess I haven't looked in the chat, Julie or, or Kelly, did, did anybody say well, what they are seeing on the screen? Oh yeah, um, good. Morels and uh, aronia berries, hazelnuts. Oh, oh. Aronia berry, hazelnuts, aronia good. Berry. And then uh, curly willows is the other one, far, far right. Okay, let's get started. So today's outline uh, for presentation, we're gonna talk about wild harvest a little bit, uh, wild and in home landscape of what you can eat in, the, in uh, just that's growing up around your yard. Then we'll talk about edibles, edible fruits and nuts that you can plant at home. And then a little bit on uh, insects and critters. And then I've got some resources that you can learn more about. So we'll keep moving. So this particular uh, slide is, is talks about the native plant communities. And if you really are interested in uh, learning more about what was there on your landscape, could be even your urban landscape, uh, pre-settlement days or, you know, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, whatever. Um, you can uh, access the Minnesota DNR website on plant communities and classifications, and you can find your location and uh, see what plants were supposed to be there or were there uh, early days. So uh, before the landscapes were changed or before uh, maybe farming took place around the area. Uh, but it's very interesting to look at if you're interested in seeing what was there historically, uh, both tree and shrubs and also uh, native plants. So perennial edibles, uh, certainly we think about the vegetative perennials that we won't be talking about today. Uh, the three that come to mind, obviously, asparagus, rhubarb, and strawberries are probably the top three uh, perennial edibles that you can plant in your yard or backyard or, or garden. And uh, they're very, very good to have um, uh, in the landscape. And then the woodies, we'll talk about some apples there and blossoming. And then uh, somebody picked up the aronia berry or black choke berry with a B not choke cherry, but choke berry. Uh, and that is uh, aronia berry there in the lower right. So wild harvest, uh, hunt, hunting uh, in the wild and picking uh, different types of native woodland harvesting, know what you're gonna harvest and when. Uh, identify the woodland or site. And then if it's public or private, you definitely wanna get permission and uh, get a written permission if it's not owned land of yourself. And then state and federal lands need a permit. And you can actually pick most of the state lands and federal lands uh, for your own family use. Uh, you cannot pick and sell uh, commercially. So that's the big key uh, usually on state and federal lands, but you can with a permit and with permission, uh, you can actually pick some of these wild edibles and decoratives uh, in the landscape. And some parks 
uh, may have specific uh, rules and regulations regarding some plants, certainly, uh, like the, uh, uh, the uh, pink lady slipper. Uh, certainly, you can't pick those or dig those out. But usually, if there's harvestable type of uh, mushrooms or ed edibles, uh, berries and so forth uh, can be allowed. And sustainable harvest. So we think about uh, leaving 90% and taking maybe 5 or 10%. Uh, certainly leave some uh, edibles and, and other resources and, and wild uh, type of, of uh, non-timber forest products for other people. This is a nice slide that uh, we got from the DNR. The DNR has some uh, presentations on foraging. I know we had a lot of questions on foraging and uh, people are interested in, in going out in the wild. So the state and na state natural areas, there's no foraging allowed. And berries, uh, mushrooms, and personal use, state parks can allow that. And berries, mushrooms, and pers for personal use in state forest. And for se fruits, seeds, mushrooms, portions of the plants, uh, for personal use, the WMAs and AMAs, uh, that's wildlife and aquatic management areas. So again, you need to get permission from the state lands on all these uh, to do some foraging. The state natural areas obviously don't allow foraging. And then you can check the... Uh, uh, different rules of what to forage, it depends. And if you don't have, or if you in, are in doubt, leave it alone. Uh, certainly other lands that you can check out is the National uh, Forest, uh, Wildlife Refuges, and Wild uh, Waterfowl Production Areas, uh, city and county and regional parks, uh, certainly may have some rules and regulations regarding their lands as well. But uh, if you live close to one of these areas, certainly ask the uh, department or the location or the office that's managing those lands and see what the uh, rules are on foraging uh, around those areas. Tips on foraging, certainly be knowledgeable about the area that you'll be selecting for harvest. Uh, and it has herbicides or pesticides been applied in that area. Avoid farm fields or dishes, avoid roadside ditches because they usually are sprayed and uh, you don't know about that. And also uh, wild parsnips is a lot in our ditches and, and can be a problem for skin rashes and so forth for some people. Avoid areas where dogs are active and then avoid areas with uh, excessive pollution. We have a ton of berries that are uh, in different locations of the state. Uh, June berries, uh, strawberries, plums, cherries, gooseberries, or currants. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, edibles that are out on the, on the wild landscape. And it varies with the region or the biome of the state. We have a, a lot of different biomes, uh, four major biomes in the state of Minnesota, but certainly uh, there are some edibles in each of the biomes. Um, the raspberries uh, and uh, elderberry is a big one, cranberry, nannyberry, uh, wild grapes, and uh, highbush cranberry. We'll talk about a few of these. Spring foraging, this will get your mouth watering, won't it? Uh, talking about leeks or ramps and fiddleheads from the ostrich fern, uh, morale mushrooms. These are some of the top uh, spring foraging uh, type of foods that you can actually go in and uh, forage with. Um, a lot of times I'll have a Z-Link at the bottom of the screen. Um, I may not have put these two on there, but uh, Z-Link is a z.umn.edu slash ramps. And then the other Z-Link is morel. Uh, morel mushrooms come up just one time a year in the spring. And uh, usually the leeks are about one time a year in the spring as well. And you can see a basket full of those uh, as well. And, and the fiddleheads from the ostrich fern. So cer certainly the leeks or ramps, uh, wild onions, uh, people actually uh, pick these uh, all over the northern part of the country and the uh, east coast as well. I know they're, they're uh, available in the woodlands over in the east coast. Um, early spring, edible. Uh, you can eat the leaves and the tubers, certainly. Uh, you may want to leave the tuber, though, obviously, uh, for further harvest in the future. And uh, probably like morales, you don't want to tell people where you find these at. Um, and then obviously, uh, harvest sustainably. Don't harvest all of them. Uh, if you leave the bulb, then the, the bulb will reproduce the uh, leaves next year and, and uh, hopefully propagate some more plants uh, in the future. The fiddlehead fern uh, is real specific to the ostrich fern. Uh, so it's a, a native ostrich fern, uh, early spring, April, May. Uh, the Minnesota Wildflowers website lists 44 ferns uh, in Minnesota. And uh, you don't want to get this confused. Uh, bracken ferns are poisonous to livestock and humans. Uh, you want to be careful about that. So you see a picture in the middle of the slide, bracken fern and the ostrich fern. Also, on uh, the lower right-hand corner is the seed head in the wintertime in the fall 
uh, the ostrich fern shoots up a seed head stem that has seeds on it. And that's very uh, re uh, recognizable for the ostrich fern. Not too many ferns have that type of, of stem in the wintertime going into the wintertime. So you may want to look at those even now in your woodlands or your property and see if you might have some of those stems around. And ostrich ferns are available in nurseries as well. So you could certainly plant those uh, in your backyard and, and develop a cluster, uh, a colony of, of ostrich fern to, to eat the fiddleheads in the spring. Brown mushrooms, uh, a favorite of many, uh, comes up once a year, uh, May or June, depending on where you're at in the state. Actually, this has been found in the whole world in almost on every continent, which is just amazing to me. Uh, it's very distinct sponge-like head. There are some lookalikes that might be dangerous to eat the fall sprawl. You can look online about that and learn more about that. Uh, but be aware that uh, there are some lookalikes that, that are dangerous. Usually you look uh, for dead elms that are slu sloughing off their, their bark. If you see a standing tree that doesn't have any bark on, uh, that may be an elm. A lot of our trees uh, usually uh, go down with the bark, but uh, the elms slough off their bark. Uh, and usually they say, uh, look around the base of the elm trees that are dying and dead uh, and laying down on the ground even, and uh, you might find some morales. But don't share your location with others. Other wild edibles, certainly uh, gooseberries, wild uh, raspberries, wild grape, dandelions, plantain, and also stinging nettles. Yeah, you say stinging nettles, holy cow. Um, I usually try and stay away from that in the woods. And certainly if you get that on your uh, trouser on your on your skin. Uh, if you're wearing shorts or even hands, you're pulling up weeds or, or look, looking down for anything in the woods. Uh, it, it can be uh, a, a touchy situation and actually, actually cause some rashes. But you actually, you can boil uh, these leaves and, and eat them. And dandelions are almost every part of the plant is edible. Uh, that's a European plant. It's not native to the United States or North America. Uh, that's been kind of naturalized. It seems like over time, plantain is another leafy type plant that you can eat uh, the leaves off. And then obviously grapes and gooseberries and uh, uh, wild raspberries are also edible. This Harry, is a there is a question. Did you okay. want to take it now or later? Uh, let's wait till the end if you could write that down or remember that, Julie, okay? Sure, I can do that. Great. Thank you. And then, uh, so this is a slide I got from Robin, uh, which is a graduate student at South Dakota State. Uh, university, and uh, I thought that was very interesting is some of the plants that I'm not going to cover. Um, and uh, downy hawthorn, that's native to the northern uh, northern climates of Minnesota and North Dakota, South Dakota. And uh, that's an edible berries and jams and teas and ketchup, I guess, is made from that. Uh, sugar maple, obviously, we get maple syrup from all the all the maples, even box elder, but obviously the most sugar content in maples is the sugar maple. Elderberry we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, that's high in antioxidants, the berry and syrups and jams and jellies people make from that. It certainly can be grown in your landscape uh, if it's not already native. Uh, staghorn sumac, and uh, this is kind of a, a sumac that obviously we see on roadsides if they're on the ditches or so forth, they uh, have underground stems and they can grow out of the intended location of the planting if they're planted, but uh, they can make uh, lemonade and some other medicinal uses as well. And then uh, American basswood, linden trees, American linden or little leaf linden. Uh, it, the, this is a large leaf linden basically, but the leaves and the flowers are edible. And uh, obviously this is a pollinator tree as, as well, the basswoods and the lindens. So if you haven't uh, purchased a basswood or a linden tree uh, for your landscape, if you have a, a nice uh, area, a sunny, sunny area to put a shade tree, if you want a shade tree, this is an excellent pollinator tree and, and a really a nice uh, pyramidal type uh, tree to plant. Also, Robin had a slide on this uh, at our meeting in uh, Laverne in January, and I thought that was nice to share. This was these are kind of the native uh, types of plants that might that are basically edible that uh, I didn't have on my slide set. And prairie onion is one, and certainly, and then wild strawberry. The cup plant uh, can be eaten raw or blanched and sautéed, and that can be gr grown uh, almost uh, five or six feet tall. That's a that's a big plant. And then the golden glow uh, rubiga. And uh, the leaves are edible early spring, used like spinach. Uh, the spirewort, prairie spirewort, uh, the tender leaves and flowers are edible. And then uh, the turnip, uh, certainly the turnip is a root uh, ball and uh, bulb, and uh, you can eat that as a, a tuber ripe in June and July. And thank you for Robin uh, for sharing those slides. Now we'll get into non-timber forest products, so forest farming and agroforestry. 
So when we talk about non-timber forest products, we talk about uh, different types of products that can be gathered from the woodlands not used for timber or not used for logs and, and uh, uh, basically lumber that's bought in the lumber yard, okay? Anything but that. So we have uh, green florals, uh, we have uh, wild edibles, medicinals, landscape, firewood even, crafts and art, miscellaneous products like soaps and oils, uh, and also forest-based cultural or ecotourism with a non-timber forest product component. Uh, so ecotourism is kind of a big thing now too. Forest farming is one of the five agroforestry practices. I have a slide on agroforestry coming up, but I wanted to show you this uh, just to kind of entice you. So this is uh, the intentional manipulation and integration and intensive management of woodlands that capitalize on specific plant interactions to produce non-timber forest products. So you see a slide here of the uh, further uh, right uh, is pine straw down south mainly. You see maple syrup there and certainly in northern climates. You see shiitake mushrooms in the center. Ginseng and other medicinal plants can be grown in the shade of the woodlands if you have a woodland uh, location. And you can adapt that uh, to different growing conditions to actually generate these uh, types of non-timber forest products to, uh, for the family or to even uh, sell. So agroforestry, I just wanted to briefly mention the five practices here, the intentional combining of agriculture and working trees to create sustainable farming systems. So here we have forest farming in the, in the center right, and then repairing forest buffers, uh, windbreaks is probably the most commonly used agroforestry practice in western and southwestern Minnesota and the rural areas. Alley cropping uh, can be done, and uh, maybe we'll see that in the future with chestnuts or black walnuts and maybe corn and soybeans between the rows. We'll see if climate change changes that. And silver pastures, grazing livestock, and sometimes at value timber or uh, woodland setting. So now we'll get into the edible fruits and nuts. And we're not going to talk about grapes today. Obviously, the University of Minnesota has been excellent in, in developing grape varieties and wine varieties. Uh, there's some edible types uh, and then obviously mostly wine uh, type of producing uh, uh, wine uh, grapes. Raspberries is a great uh, resource for the University of Minnesota Extension website. And that Z-link is a z.umn.edu um fruit. And then blackberries we're not going to talk about either. So those are some things we won't talk about. I know uh, apples is a big thing, and uh, this is a Minnesota Hardy website uh, that I do have on uh, the list of, that Kelly is, can send out to you, uh, mnhardy.umn.edu, and then has uh, slash varieties slash fruit. This is our fruit page that you have apples, berries, grapes, uh, pears, and then stone fruit. They actually list the varieties that are developed at the University of Minnesota, and then probably other varieties that can be suitable for your location. So uh, if you haven't seen that website, you certainly uh, find that and, and uh, look at those other resources. So real quickly, we have a lot of apples that are available in Minnesota. And uh, I suggest you talk to a local orchard in your area to see what apple grows best in their your location. You can also talk to the nurseries that sell the apples. And uh, probably the big uh, department stores might, might not know that, but uh, a nursery that's in the business of horticulture and selling uh, nursery plants, uh, trees and shrubs, they will probably know what variety works well in your location. I know we've had questions over the, over the years of what Northern apples can grow in Northern Minnesota better than others. And uh, there are some locations that are best uh, suited for certain varieties. So real quickly, I'll go through some of the U of M varieties. Uh, the U of M, new U of M apples uh, only at orchards are the recent developed First Kiss and then also Sweet Tango. So you cannot, as a homeowner, purchase these in, in any nurseries. There are they're um, uh, licensed only for orchards, okay? I know that's difficult to understand. Uh, early season apples, we have uh, from mid-August to early September, uh, Beacon, uh, Centennial Crab Apple, First Kiss, State Fair, uh, Sweet Tango, and Zestar. Zestar is a huge apple and recently developed, 2000, or 1999 was the development, and I think really got to, to be popular in the, in the early 2000s. Very tall tree, the Zestar tree. Uh, Mid-season, early to late September, a chestnut crab apple. If you're looking for a chestnut or looking for an apple that's actually the size of almost a golf ball, uh, it's an excellent uh, choice is a chestnut crab. And uh, if you have two trees, uh, crab apple trees or apple trees, that's all you need for pollinators on most of these apple trees. It, in fact, the apple trees will be pollinated by a crab apple that's not edible. So um, you don't have to plant 
uh, a bunch of apple trees to get apples. Red Baron, Sweet 16, Triumph. That's a new one that's coming out a little bit later probably for the development, but that I think is a homeowner variety that you can purchase, Triumph in uh, 2025. And then Honeycrisp, obviously everybody's heard of that one. Late season, late uh, September, October, Honeygold, Harrelson, uh, Frostbite, uh, Regent, Snow Sweet. Those are some new ones there. Uh, Fireside, Keepsake, and Prairie Spy. Now we'll get into some shrubs. Uh, if you've never uh, tasted a service berry, Juneberry, Saskatoon, which are kind of all synonymous, they're all in the same family. So if, if uh, you see a tag at a nursery that says Juneberry, it's basically a service berry in Saskatoon. It's the same type of uh, plant. Uh, but there's many, many different varieties. There's shrub types and small tree types. And actually the most productive, it seems like in my landscape, is the uh, shrub type. So if you're looking for a berry producing, uh, Juneberry service berry, uh, I would go with a shrub type and uh, you'll have lots of berries and if you got kids or grandkids, they're gonna love it. This is probably by far uh, the most edible and uh, taste good right off the plant uh, berry that you can pick and have in your own landscape. And you don't need really a, another uh, pollinator. I always recommend people buy two of these plants or two of almost everything, but a lot of these plants do not need uh, to be pollinated by another plant. They're self-pollinated. So, uh, but on the, on the recommendation of basically buying two plants, that's probably the best recommendation. Currents, there's red and there's black here in my landscape. And uh, there's also golden and there's some other varieties. So uh, these are probably the tartest, uh, very tart, not sweet, uh, off the vine, but people make jams and jellies out of them and they're very good. But uh, to be, eat them raw off the plant, uh, they are a little tart. American plum, uh, there's a lot of different plum varieties. Actually, my American plum is probably more for wildlife than for human consumption. So be aware of that. Uh, American plum is probably more of a wildlife planting. Uh, than uh, having it eat, eat at your table because they're pretty hard. Uh, but there's some really good plum varieties. Uh, the Alderman plum was developed at the University of Minnesota. There's other plum varieties that are recommended uh, on the extension website. Yanking cherry is a small type of uh, berry uh, that uh, can be planted in your landscape. Uh, I've, I've seen winter kill on this type of plant, but certainly worth planting. Uh, you may want to plant a few to, to uh, um, provide some berries for your family. American hazelnut. So hazelnut and also June berries, I recommend if you have a small landscape and want just something to plant for a nut crop or a, a berry crop, but June berries and hazelnuts are probably the, your two choices. Um, hazelnuts are self-pollinating. Uh, we have a very good uh, University of Wisconsin, University of Minnesota uh, development uh, coalition. Uh, that is actually working for the development of uh, varieties that are going to produce uh, larger nuts and uh, hardier for Minnesota and Wisconsin environments. But uh, it's a very, very good uh, type of plant to plant. And you can make your own uh, Nutella, actually, a little chocolate with a little nut uh, ground up and uh, be fun for the family. What's really interesting in hazelnuts, uh, so here's the, it's not a, really a big pollinator because here's the female and male parts of the plant. So the females are the flowers here that you see in the spring. These will come pop out in the spring, probably April, May. And uh, these form the nut clusters, uh, which is multiple uh, type of nuts. And I think I have a copy of that of the, of the nut cluster on the top slide there on the right. But um, these are very tiny. And then the catkins, the male catkins of the pollen formed last fall. Actually, uh, you can see on your hazelnut plants and even birch plants and trees, uh, the catkin plants, uh, they produce their catkins in the fall time of the year and they go through winter in the catkin stage like this and then they uh, release their pollen at the certain appropriate time in, in uh, April and May when uh, these um, uh, flowers, if you will, and the female flowers are forming and then obviously that produces the nuts. Pretty interesting. American cranberry, uh, another tart plant in the fall, but uh, a lot of these plants will go through winter and then uh, the first sign of the robins uh, will, will pick off the the plant, the uh, berries in the spring, if, if you're not going to harvest them. Uh, there's very good wildlife uh, planting. I've seen some of the local woodlands around uh, the Mankato and, and uh, Watanwan County area where I live. And uh, yeah, they just make a, a nice uh, planting for, for humans and wildlife. Black chokeberry, a lot of people call this aronia berry. This is high in antioxidants. It's fairly new in the last probably 10 years, 
but uh, these are native plants. Uh, you'll see some in the wild, but you can actually buy this at nurseries and uh, produce these berries and plants in your own landscape. Um, they have a fibrous root system. They can get uh, seven feet tall or six feet tall. Uh, mine's uh, still around six feet, but uh, they produce a, a nice cluster of berries. Elderberry as well, both native and then there's different varieties that you can actually select from. We have a Minnesota cooperative, uh, elderberry cooperative that you can actually plant, uh, maybe a large planting, and actually the elderberry co-op will buy these uh, sains from you and even flowers from you. There's markets for flowers and markets for the, um, for the uh, berries to make uh, jams and jellies and, and juices. It's a fairly new one that I uh, think is hard to find. Actually, I tried to find some growers uh, or some nurseries that produce these and, and it's a little bit difficult to find. Uh, this is a romance series of cherries. These are shrub cherries or sour cherries, uh, usually in the shrub form though. They're not very big. They're not a tree type. You can probably prune them to a tree type, but uh, you may want to try these if you can find them. Juliet, uh, Valentine, uh, Crimson Passion, Romeo, and Cupid are some of the varieties of this series. Honeyberry is also a new one that people haven't heard about. Uh, they're becoming more popular at nurseries. Uh, there's a Honeyberry USA that you can buy online. Uh, actually, this is kind of a Canadian type of upper um, Midwest type of plant. Uh, it's kind of a cross between a blueberry and, and raspberry. And uh, yeah, three to eight feet tall. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it's a very nice shrub plant and has a fibrous root system and may be a problem with spotted wing drosophila, which is our fruit fly that's invasive in Minnesota. And you need to protect it from the birds. The big thing about honeyberry uh, is there a, a pollination uh, chart. So a tundra and a borealis won't pollinate each other, but a tundra and a cinderella will pollinate each other, okay? So you need to buy multiple plants and the right plants to pollinate uh, the honeyberry plants uh, and they're shrubs, they're not trees. Uh, so be aware of that. And the nursery that's selling that should have this chart and the charts that uh, match up with the uh, pollination. University of Saskatchewan has been uh, the popular uh, research uh, university that's done a lot of research on honey uh, crisp, uh, or excuse me, uh, the honeyberries, also called blue honeysuckle and hascaps as well. So here's a backyard calendar. Uh, we have strawberries, hascaps, which is our, our, our uh, honeyberry. Saskatoons, Juneberries, service berries. Then we get into shower cherries uh, with raspberries and plums and apples in the fall time of the year and also grapes. Now insects, we'll really quickly uh, cover some of those. The spotted wings of is a fruit fly. It's an invasive fruit fly from uh, the Oriental uh, countries uh, on the east and found in Minnesota 2012, 29 counties and they're saying it's now statewide. I did a test with the MDA Minnesota Department of Agriculture one year, maybe it was 2012, uh, the last year they were doing testing and I had one uh, or a couple that were caught in, in my trap. And I just have wild raspberries, not too many uh, planted. Uh, they're attracted to wild, uh, healthy fruit. Uh, the males have a dark spot on the wing and uh, you wanna have two buckets when you're uh, working with raspberries or small fruit, uh, pick, out, pick out the good ones. And then uh, on the ones that are going bad, you wanna have a, a bucket for good and a bucket for bad. And uh, certainly sanitation is the key uh, to keep the berries uh, from rotting and, and falling to the ground. And that's where the uh, overwintering takes place for the adults. Uh, also, when you pick a raspberry, usually there's a clear um, radical is what's left. When you pick a raspberry, um, if that particular rad radical that's left on the vine uh, is tainted in any way, it's pink or uh, discolored in any way, then uh, you probably have a a little, uh, I'm sorry to say, a little fruit fly maggot inside your raspberry that you just picked. Now you can put those in water and put them in the refrigerator and they should come out. Uh, but uh, yeah, just for your uh, uh, knowledge that uh, that is probably the, the key to recognize uh, you might have some more protein in that raspberry than you want. Okay, red, and can affect all these types of, of small fruits. And there even aroni berries have been uh, spotted to have uh, some of those. Rabbits, uh, if you're planting trees or shrubs the first year, you really need to protect them. Uh, chicken wire, uh, tree tubes for trees, deciduous trees. Uh, rabbits will get hungry in the wintertime and go on top of the snow. And uh, if they girdle the trunk or the stems, uh, that plant is above that is dead. And so you really need to be protecting uh, uh, your trees and shrubs 
uh, early planted uh, in, in the uh, wintertime from rabbits. Some people may have pocket gophers. Those are a little bit difficult critters to control, but I know uh, they can be drawn to a lot of these root systems and uh, just be aware that they're, they're making the mound of soil on top of the ground uh, and it just needs to get some poisons and, and uh, try and eradicate them uh, as, you, as you can. Deer are many uh, problems uh, with uh, shrubs. They love June berries. I, plant, I uh, planted a uh, June berry and service berry in Saskatoon at my son's place and uh, they had deer, a uh, huddle of does, uh, maybe three or four does just munching on the green foliage and the stems uh, in the wintertime. So uh, in the front yard. So you need to really protect some of these plants from deer. They, they really like some of these uh, edibles and decoratives. Know the biology, know the habitat, and you have to improve your location. This is a really good uh, handbook on, on preventing and controlling wildlife damage. I, we do have this in the uh, website that's listed. Decoratives, real quickly, we'll get into some decoratives. So we have uh, different dogwoods and willows that you can plant in your landscape and have for your own use, or you can consider uh, contacting the, your local florist shop and see if they'd be interested in some of the stems that you might have in a windbreak or some type of uh, other planting. And uh, they actually order these from around the country. So, and I know there's one large uh, producer in Wisconsin, but if they can buy locally, certainly it might be a moneymaker for some of the kids or grandkids that you might have around the house. Also, uh, scar curls willow, fantail willow, and curly willows. There's all kinds of willows that have little pussy willows on them and also some decorative type of stems. So uh, be aware of that. And those are available. Probably have to order maybe online from one of the, one of the West Coast nurseries, but uh, they are still available to uh, purchase. And these are used in floor arrangements and, and wreaths and all kinds of things. Uh, the pussy willows uh, are very showy. And this is a pollinator plant. This is one of our earlier pollinators uh, of woodies, uh, shrubs that produce pollen for our bees that first come out in the springtime and, and other types of uh, insects that need pollen. Witch hazel, uh, cherry, apple, and uh, plums, forsythia. These are spring flowers that can be marketable or just uh, used in, in the home. Uh, show you a, a persistent fruit as holly and then also bittersweet. We have two different bittersweets in Minnesota. We have American and Oriental and we want you to know the difference. The oriental is invasive and it has underground stems. So it will, if it's established in your area, it will grow and become bigger in location. So the American is the, the right kind we want. And it has orange capsules instead of yellow capsules. And then the fruit position is very important too. In American, it's the fruit capsules are at the end of the branches and the oriental has uh, fruit capsules up and down the stem. So it's very distinct of uh, location of fruit. And then also the color is very good. So orange is good. And MDA always says yellow, yell for yellow. If you see yellow, you need to yell from the M uh, Minnesota Department of Agriculture. And this is what they do to trees. They, they girdle them. They actually kill deciduous trees by their vines and they will strangle trees and just cover them up. And uh, this is a big problem in Southeastern Minnesota. And then certainly we have pollen, uh, pollinator benefits of, of these uh, trees and shrubs producing edibles and decoratives. Uh, so we have uh, the plum picture down there, we have a cranberry picture, and we have a, a Saskatoon or Juneberry picture there on the bottom. And then we have our, our flowering uh, pussy willows in the upper right. Okay, real quickly, resources. Uh, the Minnesota Wildflowers website is just tremendous. Uh, it's a very good website for uh, all trees and shrubs, uh, vines, uh, ferns, uh, grasses and sedges, anything you can uh, find uh, in Minnesota that's native is, is in this. Uh, this is just a fantastic resource. So if you haven't uh, used that resource, certainly uh, consider that. We have a Minnesota Harvester Handbook and that's uh, Z-Link, uh, z.umn.edu slash MHH, standing for Minnesota Harvest Handbook. If you're into foraging, uh, and going in for the woods for non-timber forest products, this is probably for you because we have a lot of different topics that are covered here, table contents uh, by products and season, and then also basic tips of social markets and, and policies. And then uh, we get into biology and ecological systems of each one. We have eight mushrooms that are covered in this booklet, also six bark, sticks, and woods, 
four edible greens and berries, and then four holiday decorations, plus saps and syrups. This is another uh, good foraging type website. If you're not familiar with Cindy Hale, she does some videos and has been doing some videos uh, the last two years during COVID uh, in uh, letting people know about what is edible in your different landscapes around uh, the state. She's in Northern Minnesota, but this is Clover Valley Farms and uh, just, a, just a nice resource to have. We've also uh, done some work in uh, Nature in Place with our U of M website. So we'll probably be posting more of those edibles just in your backyard or in your driveway, uh, like dandelions and plantain and those types of things um, that uh, you can actually eat. This is a really interesting website and I just looked at it today to make sure it was still viable. This is our Explore Minnesota's and uh, website and it's talking about foraging and actually it goes into the different um, types of uh, schools. There's foraging schools or, and mainly in the upper um, uh, part of the state, the northern part of the state, and you can actually participate in some of those. And actually a lot of those are run by Native Americans and uh, it's really, really cool to learn uh, what the, the value of edibles and medicinals were used for uh, way back when. If you're looking at hazelnuts, midwesthazelnut.org uh, uh, is a great website. This is our coalition or our group with, with University of Wisconsin, University of Minnesota, uh, and uh, it has a buy hazelnuts plants there. It gives you a list of the, the people, the nurseries that sell hazelnuts, especially the varieties that we're working on, and a uh, good opportunity there to learn more about hazelnuts. If you're into mushrooms and foraging for mushrooms, wild mushrooms, I recommend you, you contact the Minnesota Mycological Society. They're a great group of individuals and volunteers that work that site. Also, they have a contact person that uh, you can actually send photographs to of mushrooms that are in the, that you're in the field or in the woods and actually ask them, you know, is it poisonous or not? Uh, and uh, they will try and get back to you as quickly as possible. And you can actually send in some uh, of these mushrooms too to see you know, what they would say that they are and how they help with identification. Uh, and they also have different forays uh, during the year in different locations of the state. So you may want to look at that and participate in their uh, woodland searches. Pretty cool. We've uh, actually, University of Minnesota has developed this uh, perennial fruit guide and that's available online. And uh, you can actually download the different uh, types of pages, hardy kiwi, black uh, chokeberry, aroni berry, choke cherries, currants, elderberries, uh, koji berries, and if you didn't talk about those uh, gooseberries and then honeyberries and then nanking cherries and much more is discussed in that pamphlet. This is what Robin had from the South Dakota State University. Uh, and I won't go through these, but uh, the book that is over in the upper uh, right hand corner is the grassland plants of South Dakota and North, Northern Great Plains. And they go into identification and uh, the medicinal uses of some of these prairie plants. It's pretty interesting. And there's some other websites on uh, perennials or, and uh, also permaculture. If you're into permaculture or learning more about it, these websites are, are uh, uh, interesting to look at and certainly have information that you can use. If you're into maple syrup, uh, we recommend this uh, Ohio, Ohio State University publication. This is North America Maple Syrup Producers Manual, and it's not very expensive, uh, 1425, and you can buy that uh, available online, or I think you can uh, do the PDF download as well. Got some various uh, Z-Links and uh, Kelly will have this resource as well. But if you're into, into some of the Z-Links real quickly, the edible fruits and nuts uh, slash edibles. Community food forest has been popular. We're talking about uh, communities that want to develop a community food forest. Uh, that's more, uh, instead of a community garden, it's more of uh, shrubs and trees that produce edibles. And uh, that's C, food forest. And then uh, the Harvester Handbook, as we mentioned before, MHH, um, Minnesota Fruit, I think we, UM Fruit, and then the Perennial Guide that we just talked about, uh, Perennial Fruit is the Z link there. And I think I'll close it off there. Uh, Kelly, it kind of went over time for 30 minutes, but uh, uh, maybe we can start some questions now. I will, or shall I keep on sharing? Let's see, Julie. Kelly? Sorry, you did send that one, um, the one link, but are there any good um, apps or websites that you could recommend for mushrooms? Ooh, mushrooms. Uh, we do have a Z-Link. Uh, I didn't put it on the, your handout there. Um, the U.S. Forest Service made one for uh, this type of region of the country, 
And uh, it's a Z link. Uh, you just do a z.umn.edu slash USFS mushrooms. Um, so it's US Forest Service mushrooms. Uh, and that should get you the PDF location, uh, unless they've changed that location, but uh, they're out of the booklets. Uh, I grabbed one or two, and I think I try and help, hold on to that one as much as I can. But yeah, that an, an app, there's probably apps, but I don't know of any. I would say contact the Minnesota Mycological Society on mushrooms. They might have some ideas of, of apps, and I think they they certainly would. I don't, I don't know if they have some in Minnesota, but there's certainly apps available out there, I'm sure. Excellent. And Good Jeffrey question. recommended a book at the U of M bookstore on mushrooms of the upper Midwest by um, Teresa Marin and Kathy um, Yurich. As we yes, thank, thank you for that recommendation, Jeff. Yes, that's a good one. I don't think uh, I've some, that one. Somebody else said that um, this is more of a comment. Service birds love service berries. Yes. And that the honey berries taste great and are easy to grow. Oh, good. And space them. Uh, that's a big thing I didn't mention about these shrubs. You want to really probably want to space them. Uh, I'd say even six or eight feet apart. I planted some of mine uh, that you know three feet apart on the honeyberries. They're way too close. Uh, because they grow in the shrub type and and I'd say probably six foot spacing because you want air to go around these plants uh, and uh, prevent powdery mildew and some of the other diseases uh, that are caused by too much moisture and um, you want some air flow uh, through those plants and obviously you want to walk around the plants to harvest and so forth. Good recommendation. Somebody asked what is Shaga? C-H-A-G-A. Yes, shaga is a kind of a mushroom or a, 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 a kind of a growth basically on birch trees. And I did not get into it, but it is one of our mushrooms that are highlighted in the Minnesota Harvester Handbook. So if you really gonna get into that, I, I'd recommend uh, you can, uh, can look at that uh, handbook or purchase the handbook. But that's, a, that's an interesting uh, uh, edible. And I have not tried it, but uh, chaga is uh, an interesting type of, of growth from birch trees. Excellent. Um, somebody asked if there is going to be a handout. And yes, after um, the webinar today, we'll send you a handout of all of the websites that Gary has talked about. And please be sure to do an evaluation. And Julie is going to put the evaluation link in the chat right now. Um, please take some time to evaluate. And then also, um, if you have any suggestions for future topics, that would be wonderful if you could include those. Gary, we've got a question about eradicating buckthorn in your oh. in our woods. Um, Andrew wants to know if there are suggestions on plants that can be planted that will out-compete buckthorn so it doesn't come back. You know, there's a university research going on right now. Um, gosh, what is it called? Um, clean, clean up or something like that. Clean up, clean up. Yeah, you can email me, uh, let me go back, email me that question. Uh, I'll try and give you some recommendations and, and there's a website uh, that's doing some research on that. Um, I think it's gonna be tough, but uh, you may have to eradicate some of your taller uh, buckthorns first. And then um, they're, they're actually researching plants and vegetative plants that will shade out, believe it or not, uh, buckthorn plants in the woodlands. But yeah, and there's a great website uh, with the DNR that is on buckthorn control. And you just do a Google search on that. And then uh, we have some excellent websites on our University of Minnesota extension website on, on buckthorn control and actually talk with some farmers uh, about their control and some of their woodies, uh, woodlands because uh, the overwintering site for soybean aphid is buckthorn and uh, farmers wanna control that. Um, Carla suggested goats too. Yes, good point. Uh, if you have some fencing or if you want to contract goats, there's businesses out there, contract goat companies that will actually come to your property and, and do fencing and release the goats in your, your landscape and they will eat buckthorn, no question about it. They'll also eat about everything else too, if you have some desirables, but um, you can fence those off uh, maybe with high, high fence, tensile wire fence or something. If you have some oak trees that you want to regenerate in your landscape or whatever, but yes, that's a good comment that uh, we're actually uh, encouraging uh, livestock to um, actually uh, uh, mow down and, and eat uh, invasive species in the woodland, including buckthorn. Um, Kate asks that, um, says that the robins are getting the majority of our honeyberries. Um, they go 
um, to them for the underneath of the shrub area. Any ideas to prevent them from doing this? Wow, in that, in that picture that I showed you uh, earlier, it had um, tall uh, stakes with uh, tin cans over the top of them, pop cans over the top of them. What they do in that location was they net, they put a, a netting over it. So you can get netting from most garden stores uh, for netting apple trees or uh, other, other fruit bearing trees. Uh, you may want to try that and then uh, just keep maybe the net. The net could be draped over the plant or just staked up above the plant. You may, may want to make sure that it's, it's going completely to the ground because uh, robins will hop around and probably go underneath the net too. But uh, yeah, honeyberry uh, berries are usually underneath the leaves and the, and the structure of the, of the limbs. So they're almost hard to, to see even uh, as humans, but uh, the robins probably uh, walk in there and, and then pick them up to the ground. Thank you. Um, and Becca and Carla both talked about the goats and um, they love they love the buckthorn and that some of our Minnesota state parks are using goats to control yes. buckthorn. Yes, that's right. Thank you for saying that. I'm actually, US, oh, yeah, US Forest Service, uh, a lot of the DNR and uh, state and federal, uh, even uh, private uh, companies that own land like the Nature Conservancy, they are using a lot of livestock, uh, including goats, and other even livestock to um, eradicate invasive species in their in their own properties. Thank you. Um, Karen asked, uh, said this was very quick. Is it being recorded for viewing again? And so yes, absolutely, Karen. We'll get that that link of the recording out to you. We'll send one out um, right right away for you to to see and know that later on you'll get another recording that will be cleaned up. So if you don't mind, that is um, not all of the different things in it. Um, you can watch it right away, but otherwise a, a cleaner version will be sent to you uh, later on along with that handout. And then also um, Julie's gonna put the evaluation link in the chat one more time. If you could just take a moment to um, be sure to, um, uh, to take that evaluation and then give us suggestions, that will be wonderful. And we've got two more family friendly earth care webinars. Uh, one on composting 101, home, food composting 101, and one on reducing your carbon footprint. So please be sure to join. And with that, thank you everyone for coming today, Gary, and thank you so much for the presentation. You're welcome. Thank you.